This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk, www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Chapter 71 Clown "'Twas in the bunch of grapes, where, indeed, you have a delight to sit, have you not? "'Froth. I have so. Because it is an open room, and good for winter. "'Clown. Why, very well, then. I hope here be truths. "'Measure for measure. Five days after the death of Raffles, Mr. Bambridge was standing at his leisure under the large archway leading into the yard of the Green Dragon. He was not fond of solitary contemplation— but he had only just come out of the house, and any human figure standing at ease under the archway in the early afternoon was as certain to attract companionship as a pigeon which has found something worth peeking at. In this case there was no material object to feed upon, but the eye of reason saw probability of mental sustenance in the shape of gossip. Mr. Hopkins, the meek-mannered draper opposite, was the first to act on this inward vision, being the more ambitious of a little masculine talk, because his customers were chiefly women. Mr. Bambridge was rather curt to the draper, feeling that Hopkins was of course glad to talk to him, but that he was not going to waste much of his talk on Hopkins. Soon, however, there was a small cluster of more important listeners, who were either deposited from the passers-by, or had sauntered to the spot expressly to see if there were anything going on at the Green Dragon, and Mr. Bambridge was finding it worth his while to say many impressive things about the fine studs he had been seeing and the purchases he had made on a journey in the north from which he had just returned. Gentlemen present were assured that when they could show him anything to cut out a blood mare, a bay rising four, which was to be seen at Doncaster if they chose to go and look at it, Mr. Bambridge would gratify them by being shot from here to Hereford. Also, a pair of blacks which he was going to put into the break recalled vividly to his mind a pair which he had sold to Faulkner in nineteen for a hundred guineas, and which Faulkner had sold for a hundred and sixty two months later— any agent who could disprove this statement being offered the privilege of calling Mr. Bambridge a very ugly name until the exercise made his throat dry. When the discourse was at this point of animation, came up Mr. Frank Hawley. He was not a man to compromise his dignity by lounging at the Green Dragon, but happening to pass along the high street and seeing Bambridge on the other side, he took some of his long strides across to ask the horse-dealer whether he had found the first-rate gig-horse which he had engaged to look for. Mr. Hawley was requested to wait until he had seen a grey selected at Bilkley. If that did not meet his wishes to a hare, Bambridge did not know a horse when he saw it, which seemed to be the highest conceivable likelihood. Mr. Hawley, standing with his back to the street, was fixing a time for looking at the grey and seeing it tried, when a horseman passed slowly by. Bulstrode, said two or three voices at once in a low tone, one of them, which was the draper's, respectfully prefixing the Mr., but nobody having more intention in this interjectual naming than if they had said the Riverston coach when that vehicle appeared in the distance. Mr. Hawley gave a careless glance round at Bulstrode's back, but as Bambridge's eyes followed it he made a sarcastic grimace. "'By jingo, that reminds me,' he began, lowering his voice a little. "'I picked up something else at Bilkley besides your gig-horse, Mr. Hawley. I picked up a fine story about Bulstrode. Do you know how he came by his fortune?' any gentleman wanting a bit of curious information, I can give it him free of expense. If everybody got their deserts, Bulstrode might have had to say his prayers at Botany Bay. "'What do you mean?' said Mr. Hawley, thrusting his hands into his pockets and pushing a little forward under the archway. If Bulstrode should turn out to be a rascal, Frank Hawley had a prophetic soul. "'I had it from a party who was an old chum of Bulstrode's. I'll tell you where I first picked him up,' said Bambridge, with a sudden gesture of his forefinger. He was at larger sale, but I knew nothing of him then. He slipped through my fingers. Was after Bulstrode, no doubt. He tells me he can tap Bulstrode to any amount. Knows all his secrets. However, he blabbed to me at Bilkley. He takes a stiff glass. Damn if I think he meant to turn King's evidence, but he's that sort of bragging fellow. The bragging runs over hedge and ditch with him till he'd brag of a spavin as if it'd fetch money. A man should know when to pull up. Mr. Bambridge made this remark with an air of disgust, satisfied that his own bragging should have fine sense of the marketable. 
"'What's the man's name, and where can he be found?' said Mr. Hawley. "'As to where he is to be found, I left him at the Saracen's Head, but his name is Raffles.' "'Raffles!' exclaimed Mr. Hopkins. "'I furnished his funeral yesterday. He was buried at Lowick. Mr. Bulstrode followed him. Very decent funeral.' There was a strong sensation among the listeners. Mr. Bambridge gave an ejaculation in which brimstone was the mildest word, and Mr. Hawley, knitting his brows and bending his head forward, exclaimed, "'What? Where did the man die?' "'At Stone Court,' said the draper. "'The housekeeper said he was a relation of the master's. "'He came there ill on Friday.' "'Why, it was on Wednesday I took a glass with him,' interposed Bambridge. "'Did any doctor attend him?' said Mr. Hawley. "'Yes. Mr. Lydgate. "'Mr. Bulstrode sat up with him one night. "'He died the third morning.' "'Go on, Bambridge,' said Mr. Hawley insistently. "'What did this fellow say about Bulstrode?' "'The group had already become larger.' the town clerk's presence being a guarantee that something worth listening to was going on there, and Mr. Bambridge delivered his narrative in the hearing of seven. It was mainly what we know, including the fact about Will Ladislaw, with some local colour added. It was what Bulstrode had dreaded the betrayal of, and hoped to have buried for ever with the corpse of Raffles. It was that haunting ghost of his earlier life, which, as he rode past the archway of the Green Dragon, he was trusting that Providence had delivered him from. Yes, Providence— he had not confessed to himself yet that he had done anything in the way of contrivance to this end. He had accepted what seemed to have been offered. It was impossible to prove that he had done anything which hastened the departure of that man's soul. But this gossip about Bulstrode spread through Middlemarch like the smell of fire. Mr. Frank Hawley followed up his information by sending a clerk, whom he could trust, to Stone Court on a pretext of inquiring about Hay, but really to gather all that could be learned about Raffles and his illness from Mrs. Abel. In this way it came to his knowledge that Mr. Garth had carried the man to Stone Court in his gig, and Mr. Hawley, in consequence, took an opportunity of seeing Caleb, calling at his office to ask whether he had time to undertake an arbitration, if it were required, and then asking him, incidentally, about Raffles. Caleb was betrayed into no word injurious to Bulstrode, beyond the fact which he was forced to admit, that he had given up acting for him within the last week. Mr. Hawley drew his references, and feeling convinced that Raffles had told his story to Garth, and that Garth had given up Bulstrode's affairs in consequence, said so a few hours later to Mr. Toller. The statement was passed on until it had quite lost the stamp of an inference, and was taken as information coming straight from Garth, so that even a diligent historian might have concluded Caleb to be the chief publisher of Bulstrode's misdemeanours. Mr. Hawley was not slow to perceive that there was no handle for the law either in the revelations made by Raffles or in the circumstances of his death. He had himself ridden to Lowick Village that he might look at the register and talk over the whole matter with Mr. Fairbrother, who was not more surprised than the lawyer that an ugly secret should have come to light about Bulstrode, though he had always had justice enough in him to hinder his antipathy from turning into conclusions. But while they were talking, another combination was silently going forward in Mr. Fairbrother's mind, which foreshadowed what was soon to be loudly spoken of in Middlemarch as a necessary putting of two and two together. With the reasons which kept Bulstrode in dread of Raffles, there flashed the thought that the dread might have something to do with his munificence towards his medical man, and though he resisted the suggestion that it had been consciously accepted in any way as a bribe, he had a foreboding that this complication of things might be of malignant effect on Lydgate's reputation. He perceived that Mr. Hawley knew nothing at present of the sudden relief from debt, and he himself was careful to glide away from all approaches toward the subject. "'Well,' he said, with a deep breath, wanting to wind up the illimitable discussion of what it might have been, though nothing could be legally proven. It is a strange story. So our mercurial Ladislaw has a queer genealogy. A high-spirited young lady and a musical Polish patriot made a likely enough stock for him to spring from, but I should never have suspected a grafting of the Jew pawnbroker. However, there's no knowing what a mixture will turn out beforehand. Some sorts of dirt serve to clarify." "'Just what I should have expected,' said Mr. Hawley, mounting his horse. "'Any cursed alien blood, Jew, Corsican, or Gypsy. "'I know he's one of your black sheep, Hawley, "'but he is really a disinterested, unworldly fellow,' said Fairbrother, smiling. "'Ay, ay, that is your wiggish twist,' said Mr. Hawley, "'who had been in the habit of saying apologetically "'that Fairbrother was such a damned, pleasant, good-hearted fellow "'you would mistake him for a Tory.' Mr. Hawley rode home without thinking of Lydgate's attendance on Raffles in any other light than as a piece of evidence on the side of Bulstrode. But the news that Lydgate had all at once become able not only to get rid of the execution in his house, but to pay all his debts in Middlemarch, was spreading fast, 
gathering round it conjectures and comments which gave it new body and impetus and soon filling the ears of other persons besides mr holly who were not slow to see a significant relation between this sudden command of money and bulstrode's desire to stifle the scandal of raffles that the money came from bulstrode would infallibly have been guessed even if there had been no direct evidence of it for it had beforehand entered into the gossip about lydgate's affairs that neither his father-in-law nor his own family would do anything for him and direct evidence was furnished not only by a clerk at the bank but by innocent mrs bulstrode herself who mentioned the loan to mrs plymdale who mentioned it to her daughter-in-law of the house of toller who mentioned it generally the business was felt to be so public and important that it required dinners to feed it and many invitations were just then issued and accepted on the strength of this scandal concerning bulstrode and lydgate wives widows and single ladies took their work and went out to tea oftener than usual and all public conviviality from the green dragon to dollops gathered a zest which could not be won from the question whether the lords would throw out the reform bill for hardly anybody doubted that some scandalous reason or other was at the bottom of bulstrode's liberality to lydgate mr hawley indeed in the first instance invited a select party including the two physicians with mr toller and mr wrench expressly to hold a close discussion as to the probabilities of raffles's illness reciting to them all the particulars that the death was due to delirium tremens and the medical gentlemen who all stood undisturbedly on the old paths in relation to this disease declared that they could see nothing in these particulars which could be transformed into a positive ground of suspicion but the moral grounds of suspicion remained the strong motives bulstrode clearly had for wishing to be rid of raffles and the fact that at this critical moment he had given lydgate the help which he must for some time have known the need for the disposition moreover to believe that bulstrode would be unscrupulous and the absence of any indisposition to believe that lydgate might be as easily bribed as other haughty-minded men when they have found themselves in want of money even if the money had been given merely to make him hold his tongue about the scandal of bulstrode's earlier life the fact threw an odious light on lydgate who had long been sneered at as making himself subservient to the banker for the sake of working himself into predominance and discrediting the elder members of his profession hence in spite of the negative as to any direct sign of guilt in relation to the death at stone court mr hawley's select party broke up with the sense that the affair had an ugly look but this vague conviction of indeterminable guilt which was enough to keep up as much head-shaking and biting innuendo even among substantial professional seniors had for the general mind all the superior power of mystery over fact everybody liked better to conjecture how the thing was than simply to know it for conjecture soon became more confident than knowledge and had a more liberal allowance for the incompatible even the more definite scandal concerning bulstrode's earlier life was for some minds melted into the mass of mystery as so much lively metal to be poured out in dialogue and to take such fantastic shapes as heaven pleased this was the tone of thought chiefly sanctioned by mrs dollop the spirited landlady of the tankard in slaughter lane who had often to resist the shallow pragmatism of customers disposed to think that their reports from the outer world were of equal force with what had come up in her mind how it had been brought to her she didn't know but it was there before her as if it had been scored with a chalk on the chimney-board bulstrode should say he is inside that black as if the hairs of his head showed the thoughts of his heart he'd tear em up by the roots that's odd said mr limp a meditative shoemaker with weak eyes and a piping voice why i read in the trumpet that was what the duke of wellington said when he turned his coat and went over to the romans very like said mrs trollope if one rascal said it it's more reason why another should but hypocrite as he's been and holdin things with that eye and as there was no parson in the country good enough for him he was forced to take old harry into his counsel and old harry's been too many for him ay ay he's a complice you can't send down the country said mr crabbe the glazier who gathered much news and groped among it dimly but what i can't make out is there's them says bulstrode was for runnin away for fear of being found out before now he'll be drove away whether or no said mr dill the barber who had just dropped in i shaved fletcher hawley's clerk this morning he's got a bad finger and he says they're all of one mind to get rid of bulstrode mr thesiger is turned against him and wants him out of the parish and there's gentlemen in this town says they'd as soon dine with the fellow from the hulks and a deal sooner i would says fletcher for what's more against one's stomach than a man coming and making himself bad company with his religion and giving out as the ten commandments were not enough for him and all the while he's worse than half the men at the treadmill fletcher said so himself 
"'It'll be a bad thing for the town, though, if Bulstrode's money gets out of it,' said Mr. Limp, quaveringly. "'Ah, there's better folks spend their money worse,' said a firm voice Dyer, whose crimson hands looked out of keeping with his good-natured face. "'But he won't keep his money by what I can make out,' said the glazier. "'Don't they say as there's somebody can strip it off him?' "'By what I can understand, they could take every penny off him if they went to law in.' "'No such thing,' said the barber, who felt himself a little above his company at Dollops, but liked it none the worse. "'Fletcher says it's no such thing. He says they might prove over and over again whose child this young Lunders law was, and they'd do no more than if they proved I came out of the fens. He couldn't touch a penny.' "'Look you there, no,' said Mrs. Dollop indignantly. "'I thank the Lord he took my children to himself, if that's all the law can do for the motherless.' "'Then, by what it's no use your father and mother is, but as to listening and what one lawyer says without asking another, I wonder a man of your cleverness, Mr. Dill. It's well known there's always two sides, if no more, else who to go to law? Oh, I should like to know. It's a poor tale with all the laws there is up and down, and if it's no use proving whose child you are, Fletcher may say that if he likes, but I say, don't you Fletcher me!' Mr. Dill affected to laugh in a complimentary way at Mrs. Dollop, as a woman who was more than a match for the lawyers, being disposed to submit to too much twitching from a landlady who had a long score against him. "'If they come to law, and it's all true, as folks say, there's more to be looked to nor money,' said the glazier. "'There's this poor creature is dead and gone, by what I can make out. He's seen the day when he was a deal finer gentleman, nor Bulstrode. "'Finer gentleman, I'll warrant him,' said Mrs. Dollop, "'and a far personabler man, by what I can hear.' "'As I said, when Mr. Baldwin, the tax-gatherer, comes in, a stand, and where you sit, and says Bulstrode got all his money as he brought into this town by thieving and swindling, oh, I said, you don't make me no wiser, Mr. Baldwin, it's set my blood a-creeping to look at him ever since here he came into Slaughter Lane, a-wanting to buy the house over my head. Folks don't look to colour a dough tub and stare at you as if they wanted to see into your backbone for nothing. That was what I said, and Mr. Baldwin can bear me witness.' "'and in the rights of it, too,' said Mr. Crabbe, "'for by what I can make out. "'This Raffles, as they call him, "'was a lusty, fresh-coloured man as you'd wish to see, "'and the best of company, "'though dead he lies in Lowick Churchyard, sure enough. "'But what I can understand, "'there's them knows more than they should know "'about how he got there. "'I'll believe you,' said Mrs. Dollop, "'with a touch of scorn at Mr. Crabbe's apparent dimness. "'When a man's been twice to a lone house, "'and there's them that can pay for hospitals and nurses "'for half the countryside, "'choose to be sitters up night and day, "'and nobody come near but a doctor "'as is known to stick at nothing as poor as he can hang together, "'and after that so flush of money "'he can pay off Mr. Biles the butcher his bill "'that's been running for the best of joints "'since last Michaelmas was a twelfth month. "'I don't want anybody to come and tell me "'there's been more going on nor the prayer book's got a service for. "'I don't want to stand winking and blinking and thinking.' Mrs. Dollop looked round with the air of a landlady accustomed to dominate her company. There was a cornice of adhesion from the more courageous, but Mr. Limp, after taking a draught, placed his flat hands together and pressed them hard between his knees, looking down at them with blear-eyed contemplation, as if the scorching power of Mrs. Dollop's speech had quite dried up and nullified his wits until they could be brought round again by further moisture. "'Why shouldn't they dig the man up and have the crowner?' said the dyer. "'It's been done many and many's the time.' "'If there has been foul play, they might find it out.' "'Not they, Mr. Jonas,' said Mrs. Dollop emphatically. "'I know what doctors are. "'They are a deal too cunning to be found out. "'And this Dr. Lidgate, that's been for cutting up everybody "'before the breath as well out of their body, "'it's plain enough what use he wanted to make "'a looking into respectable people's insides. "'He knows drugs, you may be sure, "'as you can neither smell nor see, "'neither before they're swallowed nor after. "'Why, I've seen drops myself ordered by Dr. Gambit, "'as is our club doctor and a good character.' and has brought more live children into the world nor ever another in middlemarch i say i've seen drops myself as made no difference whether they was in the glass or out and yet have gripped you the next day so i'll leave your own sense to judge don't tell me all i say is it's a mercy they didn't take this dr lydgate on to our club as many a mother's child might have rued it the heads of this discussion at dollops had been the common theme among all classes in the town had been carried to lowick parsonage on one side and to tipton grange on the other had come fully to the ears of the vincey family and had been discussed with sad reference to poor harriet by all mrs bulstrode's friends before lydgate knew distinctly why people were looking strangely at him and before bulstrode himself suspected the betrayal of his secrets he had not been accustomed to very cordial relations with his neighbours and hence he could not miss the signs of cordiality 
Moreover, he had been taking journeys on business of various kinds, having now made up his mind that he need not quit Middlemarch, and feeling able, consequently, to determine on matters which he had before left in suspense. "'We will make a journey to Cheltenham in the course of a month or two, he had said to his wife. "'There are great spiritual advantages to be had in that town, along with the air and the waters, and six weeks there will be eminently refreshing to us.' He really believed in the spiritual advantages, and meant that his life henceforth should be the more devoted because of those latter sins which he represented to himself as hypothetic, praying hypothetically for their pardon, if I have herein transgressed. As to the hospital, he avoided saying anything further to Lydgate, fearing to manifest a too sudden change of plans immediately on the death of Raffles. In his secret soul he believed that Lydgate suspected his orders to have been intentionally disobeyed, and in suspecting this he must also suspect a motive. But nothing had been betrayed to him as to the history of Raffles, and Bulstrode was anxious not to do anything which would give emphasis to his undefined suspicions. As to any certainty that a particular method of treatment would either save or kill, Lydgate himself was constantly arguing against such dogmatism. He had no right to speak, and he had every motive for being silent. Hence Bulstrode felt himself providentially secured. The only incident he had strongly winced under had been an occasional encounter with Caleb Garth, who, however, had raised his hat with mild gravity. Meanwhile, on the part of the principal townsman, a strong determination was growing against him. A meeting was to be held in the town hall on a sanitary question which had risen into pressing importance by the occurrence of a cholera case in the town. Since the Act of Parliament, which had been hurriedly passed, authorizing assessments for sanitary measures, there had been a board for the superintendence of such measures, appointed in Middlemarch, and much cleansing and preparation had been concurred by Whigs and Tories. The question now was whether a piece of ground outside the town should be secured as a burial ground by means of assessment or by private subscription. The meeting was to be open, and almost everybody of importance in the town was expected to be there. Mr. Bulstrode was a member of the board, and just before twelve o'clock he started from the bank with the intention of urging the plan of private subscription. Under the hesitation of his projects he had, for some time, kept himself in the background, and he felt that he should, this morning, resume his old position as a man of action and influence in the public affairs of the town, where he expected to end his days. Among the various persons going in the same direction he saw Lydgate. They joined, talked over the object of the meeting, and entered it together. It seemed that everybody of Mark had been earlier than they, but there were still spaces left near the head of the large central table, and they made their way thither. Mr. Fairbrother sat opposite, not far from Mr. Hawley. All the medical men were there. Mr. Thesiger was in the chair, and Mr. Brooke of Tipton on his right hand. Lydgate noticed a peculiar interchange of glances when he and Bulstrode took their seats. After the business had been fully opened by the chairman, who pointed out the advantages of purchasing by subscription a piece of ground large enough to be ultimately used as a general cemetery, Mr. Bulstrode, whose rather high-pitched but subdued and fluent voice the town was used to at meetings of this sort, rose and asked leave to deliver his opinion. Lydgate could see again the particular interchange of glances before Mr. Hawley started up and said in his firm, resonant voice, "'Mr. Chairman, I request that before any one delivers his opinion on this point, I may be permitted to speak on a question of public feeling, which not only by myself, but by many gentlemen present, is regarded as preliminary.' Mr. Hawley's mode of speech, even when public decorum oppressed his awful language, was formidable in its curtness and self-possession. Mr. Thesiger sanctioned the request, and Mr. Bulstrode sat down, and Mr. Hawley continued. "'In what I have to say, Mr. Chairman, I am not speaking simply on my own behalf. I am speaking with the concurrence and at the expressed request of no fewer than eight of my fellow townsmen, who are immediately around us. It is our united sentiment that Mr. Bulstrode should be called upon— and I do now call upon him, to resign public positions which he holds, not simply as a taxpayer, but as a gentleman among gentlemen. There are practices, and there are acts, which, owing to circumstances, the law cannot visit, though they may be worse than many things which are legally punishable. Honest men, and gentlemen, if they don't want the company of people who perpetrate such acts, have got to defend themselves as best they can, and that is what I and the friends whom I call my clients in this affair are determined to do. I don't say that Mr. Bulstrode has been guilty of shameful acts, but I call upon him, either publicly, to deny and confute the scandalous statements made against him by a man, now dead, and who died in his house, the statements that he was for many years engaged in nefarious practices, 
and that he won his fortune by dishonest procedures, or else to withdraw from positions which could only have been allowed him as a gentleman among gentlemen. All eyes in the room were turned on Mr. Bulstrode, who, since the first mention of his name, had been going through a crisis of feeling almost too violent for his delicate frame to support. Lydgate, who himself was undergoing a shock, as from the terrible practical interpretation of some faint augury, felt nevertheless that his own movement of resentful hatred was checked by that instinct of the healer which thinks first of bringing rescue or relief to the sufferer when he looked at the shrunken misery of Bulstrode's livid face. The quick vision that his life was, after all, a failure, that he was a dishonoured man and must quail before the glance of those towards whom he had habitually assumed the aptitude of a reprover, that God had disowned him before men and left him unscreened to the triumphant scorn of those who were glad to have their hatred justified, the sense of utter futility in that equivocation with his conscience in dealing with the life of his accomplice, an equivocation which now turned venomously upon him with the full-grown fang of a discovered lie, all this rushed through him like the agony of terror which fails to kill and leaves the ear still open to the returning wave of execration. The sudden sense of exposure after the re-established sense of safety came, not to the coarse organization of a criminal, but to the susceptible nerve of a man whose intensest being lay in such mastery and predominance as the conditions of his life had shaped for him. But in that intense being lay the strength of reaction. Through all his bodily infirmity there ran a tenacious nerve of ambitious, self-preserving will, which had continuously leaped out like a flame, scattering all doctrinal fears, and which, even while he sat an object of compassion for the merciful, was beginning to stir and glow under his ashy paleness. Before the last words were out of Mr. Hawley's mouth, Bulstrode felt that he should answer, and that his answer should be a retort. He dared not get up and say, "'I am not guilty. The whole story is false.' Even if he had dared this, it would have seemed to him, under his present keen sense of betrayal, as vain as to pull, for covering his nakedness, a frail rag which would rend at every little strain. For a few moments there was total silence, while every man in the room was looking at Bulstrode. He sat perfectly still, leaning hard against the back of his chair. He could not venture to rise, and when he began to speak he pressed his hands upon the seat on each side of him, but his voice was perfectly audible though hoarser than usual, and his words were distinctly pronounced, though he paused between sentences, as if short of breath. He said, turning first toward Mr. Thesiger, and then looking at Mr. Hawley, "'I protest before you, sir, as a Christian minister, against the sanctions of proceedings towards me, which are dictated by virulent hatred. Those who are hostile to me are glad to believe any libel uttered by a loose tongue against me, and their consciences become strict against me.' I say that the evil speaking, of which I am to be made the victim, accuses me of malpractices. Here Bulstrode's voice rose, and took on a more biting accent, till it seemed a low cry. Who shall be my accuser? Not men whose own lives are unchristian, nay, scandalous. Not men who themselves who use low instruments to carry out their ends, whose profession is a tissue of chicanery, who have been spending their income on their own sensual enjoyments while I have been devoting mine to advance the best objects with regard to this life and the next. After the word chicanery there was a growing noise, half of murmurs and half of hisses, while four persons started up at once, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Toller, Mr. Chichley, and Mr. Hackbutt, but Mr. Hawley's outburst was instantaneous and left the others behind in silence. "'If you mean me, sir, I call on you and every one else to the inspection of my professional life, as to Christian or unchristian, I repudiate your canting, palavering Christianity, and as to the way in which I spend my income, it is not my principle to maintain thieves and cheat offspring of their due inheritance in order to support religion and set myself up as a saintly killjoy. I affect no niceness of conscience. I have not found any nice standards necessary yet to measure your actions by, sir." and I again call upon you to enter into satisfactory explanations concerning the scandals against you, or else to withdraw from posts in which we at any rate decline you as a colleague. I say, sir, we decline to cooperate with a man whose character is not cleared from infamous lights cast upon it, not only by reports, but by recent actions. Allow me, Mr. Hawley, said the chairman, and Mr. Hawley, still fuming, bowed half impatiently and sat down with his hands thrust deep in his pockets. Mr. Bulstrode, it is not desirable, I think, to prolong the present discussion. 
said Mr. Thesiger, turning to the pallid, trembling man. "'I must so far concur with what has fallen from Mr. Hawley in expression of general feeling, as to think it due to your Christian profession that you should clear yourself, if possible, from unhappy aspersions. I, for my part, should be willing to give you full opportunity in hearing. But I must say that your present attitude is painfully inconsistent with those principles which you have sought to identify yourself with, and for the honour of which I am bound to care, I recommend you at present, as your clergyman, and as one who hopes for your reinstatement in respect, to quit the room and avoid further hindrance to business. Mr. Bulstrode, after a moment's hesitation, took his hat from the floor and slowly rose, but he grasped the corner of the chair so totteringly that Lydgate felt sure there was not strength enough in him to walk away without support. What could he do? He could not see a man sink close to him for want of help. He rose and gave his arm to Bulstrode, and in that way led him out of the room. Yet this act, which might have been one of gentle duty and pure compassion, was at this moment unspeakably bitter to him. It seemed as if he were putting his sign-manual to that association of himself with Bulstrode, of which he now saw the full meaning, as it must have presented itself to other minds. He now felt the conviction that this man, who was leaning tremblingly on his arm, had given him the thousand pounds as a bribe, and that somehow the treatment of Raffles had been tampered with from an evil motive. The inferences were closely linked enough. The town knew of the loan, believed it to be a bribe, and believed that he took it as a bribe. Poor Lydgate! His mind, struggling under the terrible clutch of this revelation, was all the while morally forced to take Mr. Bulstrode to the bank, send a man off for his carriage, and wait to accompany him home. Meanwhile, the business of the meeting was dispatched, and fringed off into eager discussion among various groups concerning this affair of Bulstrode and Lydgate. Mr. Brooke, who had before heard only imperfect hints of it, and was very uneasy that he had gone a little too far in countenancing Bulstrode, now got himself fully informed, and felt some benevolent sadness in talking to Mr. Fairbrother about the ugly light in which Lydgate had come to be regarded. Mr. Fairbrother was going to walk back to Lowick. "'Step into my carriage,' said Mr. Brooke. "'I am going round to see Mrs. Casaubon. She was come back to Yorkshire last night. She would like to see me, you know.' So they drove along, Mr. Brooke chatting with good-natured hope that there had not really been anything black in Lydgate's behaviour, a young fellow whom he had seen to be quite above the common mark, when he brought a letter from his uncle Sir Godwin. Mr. Fairbrother said little. He was deeply mournful. With a keen perception of human weakness, he could not be confident that under the pressure of humiliating needs Lydgate had not fallen below himself. When the carriage drove up to the gate of the manor, Dorothy was out on the gravel, and came to greet them. "'Well, my dear,' said Mr. Brooke, "'we have just come from a meeting, a sanitary meeting, you know.' "'Was Mr. Lydgate there?' said Dorothea, who looked full of health and animation, and stood with her head bare under the gleaming April lights. "'I want to see him, and have a great consultation with him about the hospital. I have engaged with Mr. Bulstrode to do so.' "'Oh, my dear,' said Mr. Brooke, "'we have been hearing bad news, bad news, you know.' They walked through the garden towards the churchyard gate, Mr. Fairbrother wanting to go on to the parsonage, and Dorothea heard the whole sad story. She listened with deep interest, and begged to hear twice over the facts and impressions concerning Lydgate. After a short silence, pausing at the churchyard gate and addressing Mr. Fairbrother, she said energetically, "'You don't believe that Mr. Lydgate is guilty of anything base? I will not believe it. Let us find out the truth and clear him.'" End of chapter 71 End of book 7